Many other types of variables are hard to order or can't be ordered. For example, think of testing a program that calculates payroll, including payroll taxes, and then it writes paychecks. A company probably treats full-time employees differently from part-time and differently from contractors. It probably treats these as three distinct equivalence classes, employees, part-timers, and contractors. But where's the best representative? What makes one full-time employee a better test case than another one? Sometimes there is no best representative. You just have to randomly sample from the set. We've covered a lot more ground, so I'm going to pause again to sum up. This slide collects my definitions of equivalence classes, boundaries, and best representatives. Here's an expanded description of the domain testing process as we've covered it so far. Compared to the last summary, I've added a distinction between primary and secondary dimensions and another distinction between ordered and unordered variables. We're still in the middle of considering relationships between risk and domain testing, and we're just about to start considering multidimensional or multivariable domains. In the first significant book on software testing, Glenn Myers introduced his approach to domain testing with the triangle problem. This has become the classic domain testing example. Myers included many examples of tests along secondary dimensions, like testing letters in numeric fields, or only entering two values when the program needed three. Myers didn't differentiate between primary and secondary dimensions. The example challenged the reader to imagine how to test a triangle. And then he said, gotcha! I bet you didn't think of these tests. He created a tradition of gotcha examples that ended up presenting these long lists of interesting ideas. Looking at the lists, or especially at equivalence class tables that were based on them, you see dozens of tests, sometimes hundreds of tests, but it's hard to tell from these lists what risks have been covered, what haven't been covered, and in many cases why anybody would care about that test anyway. Let me illustrate the variety of secondary dimensions with a list that Hong Nguyen and I use for floating point data entry fields. Notice that this list only considers generic floating point fields. We aren't considering how the program uses the field. So for example, if we knew that the field was a page width field, we'd add tests to consider how changing the page width changes other things. We'd look at distortion of the text on the slide. We'd also look for memory leaks and other memory corruption. But even with just the generic values, we've got an incomplete set of secondary dimensions, but a useful one. How do we show this on a table? I relied on the traditional equivalence class table for a long time. I still use it for basic boundary analyses. But when I start thinking about what can go wrong with this field, what its risks are, I find it easier to work with a table like this one, which explicitly incorporates risk-oriented thinking into the analysis. As with the classic table, this one's still focused on equivalence classes. It just organizes the information a little differently. You fill it out in a different order. In my experience, that change in order changes how you think about the problem. The first column in the table is the name of the variable you're testing. Always start a domain analysis by deciding what variable you're focused on. If you're not focused on a variable, you're not doing domain testing. The next column names a risk. What do you think could go wrong? By naming a risk, I put myself into a better position to think of tests that can expose that kind of failure. The more vague the name of the risk, the less guidance I have for my tests, and the less guidance I give anyone else who's reviewing my work. If they can't understand what I'm thinking, they can't coach me on my blind spots. The table on this slide shows two specific risks. The first risk is that the program attempts to create a page that's too small. How do you get the program to do that? Well, the obvious way is to give it a page width that's less than an inch and see what happens. The table lists three of that kind of test. The boundary case, 0.99, a zero, and a negative page width. The second risk is that the program will distort graphics when you resize the page. We've run that test already. Start by putting a graphic on a slide and then change the dimensions of the slide. But when you focus on that risk, you're probably gonna recognize that the program might corrupt some types of graphics more than others. So the best version of this test is probably going to include different slides with different types of graphics, some bitmaps and some in scalable formats. This slide summarizes the points I just made about the chart. Some people add an expected results column to their tables. I find this helpful in my own work too, but let me make a couple points. First, the expected result is the result the program should give you. If the program doesn't give you the expected result, that should be the bug. So resizing the slide shouldn't distort the graphics. It shouldn't corrupt the program's memory. So those can't be expected results, even if that's what you think is actually what's going to happen. 
If you want to describe a failure that you're hoping to find, that's not an expected result. Put it in notes. The second point is that some people insist that you must always have an expected result for every test, and you should always document your expected results. Some of them go so far as to say that if you're not documenting your expected results, you're not testing. I think this is one of the dumbest ideas in all of testing. Now, it is useful to ask yourself what results you expect from a test. And if you can't answer that, it is often useful to do some more research or to do some more thinking, which might lead you to an expected result. And if you do have an expected result, and if you have time to create the documentation, writing it down might sometimes be valuable for later. But our best tests look for information that we don't already have. Sometimes the fact that you don't know what you're going to find is the very best reason to run the test to find out. Let me close this part of the lecture with a summary comparison of the two types of tables. I find the traditional table easier to use. I'll often start my analysis of a variable with the traditional table because it focuses me on the primary dimension. It gets me thinking about what the program will do with my data if I enter the kind of data that it expects. That's a useful kind of thinking and the table provides a simple, concise summary of that analysis. Once I understand how the program should use the variable, I start thinking about how it can go wrong. The risk-oriented table helps me work through that kind of thinking. It takes more time, it takes more thinking, but when I really want to think through the implications of a variable, this is a tool that I find handy.